when, when, we, when we start realizing, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are we saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest we boast and brag about it. You know, that grace is something that it ought to be so formidable in our lives that we understand. If we don't see our lives through grace, then we'll see ourselves through law. We'll see ourselves through legalism. We'll see ourselves through every other schism that comes out of religion. And pretty soon, you will doubt your own salvation because why? You keep thinking you're supposed to do something or be something. And God says, you're going to have to tell your carnal mind to take a rest. You're going to have to learn to listen to me. Let me lead and guide you. That's why I said, by my grace, my unfair, unmerited favor, shall you be known in this world. Ain't no way to come and say, well, why did God pick you or others? I don't know. I'm just glad he did. <laughs> I mean, when I can look at the word of God and I can say, hey, am I on? Yeah. Praise God. When I sit down and I think about the goodness of God and I think about his mercy and I start thinking, my God, I'm so undeserving. God, why shouldn't I? And he said, sound like you know my scripture. Undeserving. Unmerited. You didn't earn it or deserve it. So guess what? Grace becomes our healer. I heard Joseph Prince say it one time, and, I, and I've never forgot it, when he said, you, you need to understand that the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came. Everybody say came. It came. So grace is not a, uh, uh, a doctrine. It's a person. Grace came. Jesus is the grace gift of God to us. And therefore, we cannot afford to sit back and watch that grace sit dormant. We must apply it to our life. We need healing. We need deliverance. We need our eyes opened up. We need enlightenment. We need enlargement. We need illumination. Is that true? Then we need that grace. Because if I use my carnal intellect to try to figure out, well, should God bless me more, then I will start making up reasons why he should or should not which is going to cause distortion. God said, no, I buried the old you. Keep him buried. I want you to be the new you. See, our relationship with God, ourselves and others, are interconnected and affect each other. I'm affected if you're not here. You're affected if you're not here. There's something about when you love people and they're not there, immediately it, it makes you wonder what's going on, where are they at? So you have to say, well, I don't want to judge them. I love them, God. I hope they're all coming there. Whatever the reason is, we are all tied together in the kingdom of God. That's why when you meet another believer, it's not, what brand are you? What flavor are you? No. There's going to be one brand in heaven. It's the brand called Christ chosen elected bunch. Can I get an amen? Then if you're the chosen elected bunch, then guess what? He preeminates you over others. Jesus prayed for those who would follow him. And he said, I don't pray for the world. I pray over those that belong to me. That's why he is an intercessor and he stands before the throne of God and makes intercession for the who? The saints. Everybody say saints. saints. See, saints means ain'ts. You ain't what the devil says you are. You ain't what the world says you are. You're a saint because of what God says you are. See, this ought to be something that you... Get down inside you a seed deep and say, I refuse and reject and renounce all the temptations that try to pull me away from the grace of God. Grace is something like you've got to hug it, you've got to embrace it, you've got to learn it, you've got to grow in it, and therefore it will start magnifying your office in this world. 1 Peter 3.11 It says... Let him eschew or hate evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Are over the righteous. You know he's sitting there looking at us tonight? His eyes are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. If we really thought that, I mean, I'm, I'm, well, I see people that I know that are prayer people. Man, they really get it on. My wife's one. The other day when that attack came against her and she'd overshot some of that medication she had, she took the wrong stuff and she was supposed to take this 15 units of some fast-acting medicine and 
take that twice a day, and then says it takes 90 units of this slow-acting stuff. Well, she mixed it up, and she took 90 units of the fast-acting. And I mean, she was freaking out at the kitchen table. I mean, in there, I was going, what's the matter? What's the matter? She said, oh, my God, I took the oven. She did it before and just took 30 units, and, and her heart was coming out of her chest, and she, was, she thought she was going to die. And, you know, I was listening to her, and she was going around and panicking and going, I said, stop. Right now, in the name of Jesus, get over here. I'm going to pray for you. I said, you lying devil from hell, you get off of her. You fear? You hear me fear? Get off of my wife right now in Jesus' name. Do you realize, I, when I bound it and I said, I do not want, not one side effect, nothing. You're not going to get one thing. And she was praying in tongues and I was praying in English. And when we got through, she said, amen. And yet she did not have one side effect. We talked to Betty and Betty said, well, get her some orange juice. She's drinking to be safe. She drank a little short thing of orange juice. And we went out and shed pancakes with syrup. She slept like a baby. She got up, not a problem one. But you see, fear will try to say, you're not worth saving. You're not worth the inheritance that God has for you. You're stupid. And you've got to say, wait a minute, Todd. The minute I start I'm getting overramped by fear or by something I don't understand, that's time for me to humble myself, not try to defend myself. That's when you get out of that. Probably, if truth known, if she wouldn't have calmed down, she'd have went into shock. In other words, the very thing, she would accelerate her adrenal glands, and that stuff would have then had a complete different adversity on her body. But because she calmed down, let the peace of God and the Holy Ghost come in there, she had no side effects. So there is something about this element that God wants us to know. He wants us to know that peace with God, ourselves and others, is a vitalness to happiness. You can't be happy if you're troubled. You can't be happy if you're stressed out. You can't be happy when there's family problems with your children. There's things that are constantly trying to steal the grace that God's provided you. It's almost like saying, well, how can I be happy if everybody else is miserable? Well, guess what? You're being happy for their misery. If you don't live it in front of people, then they're not going to believe it's real. I've had more people say, how come you're happy, man? You, what do you got? You got nothing. I said, excuse me? I've got Jesus of Nazareth living in the bosom of my chest, and he's never going to leave me or forsake me. You walk in the light as he's in the light, and you will always taste his goodness. Can I get an amen? See, people analyze themselves too much. Analyzing means that we are separation of the whole into constitute little parts. And we view it and examine it and we try to interpret it and have statements to result in our study. See, God didn't tell us to use our brain to figure him out. He told us to use our brain for all the different things we have to do in our life, but not to figure him out. Well, you think I did enough today good and he's going to give me that? See, then you're going to get into works, performance, and perfection by your own effort, which is going to make grace be buried and all this other stuff is going to be elevated and you're going to start thinking you deserve what you're getting because of what you do. See, the minute we think we deserve, we need grace again. God, humble me. Don't let me get out of control. Don't let me get way out there where I'm going to miss it. See, the fear of rejection opens the door to this trap. Once you forget that it was by grace that you were saved, then all of a sudden, you start elevating yourself and your own ideas in your mind. Well, I'll do this good work, and I'll do this good work, and I'll do this good work. And pretty soon, you've done, tried to do enough good work that you almost start patting yourself on the back thinking, you know what? I'm pretty good. I'll tell you, the devil's deceitful and treacherous, and he will get you out there on a place where you're actually bragging on yourself, comparing yourself against others that ain't doing as much as you're doing. And now you're falling away just like they are. Because why? You are causing yourself to be put into a place of judgment. God wants us to get inside grace, say, Oh, God, thank you for your grace that I'm saved through faith. I believe that, God. I'm not going to have to prove myself. It don't matter if i got got 100 people here tonight or not. I talked to a preacher the other day, and he says, Oh, James, that was the days when we had 100 on Wednesday night. Man, it was awesome. And to that man, that was the epitome of success. But now his church is down to hardly anything. He's 70-something years old. It's something about when your life starts getting older, you start feeling now 
Did I really do anything? Did I mean anything? And that's when you must shake yourself and say, by grace was I saved. Well, I couldn't add a cupid to my stature. Whether I did a whole lot or I didn't do nothing doesn't change the position that we are with God. See, grace is the gift of God's love offered by an undeserving and unworthy is us. It's a gift that God offered to the undeserving and the unworthy. The minute you think you were worthy or you deserve it, there's a lot of people that start tooting their horns up. Well, I don't sin anymore. I'm perfect now. You know, I'm in grace and da-da-da. I said, no, you call God a liar then. He said, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And he was talking to the church. But if you say you have no sin, you make God a liar and the truth isn't in you. My dear children, I would that you not sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation or an appeasement for your sin. So what God's trying to say is, look, stop being sin conscious and start being righteous conscious. That means let grace work out its way in your life over law. Don't let yourself be whooped into that trap. See, the word grace is the word charis. It's the same word as accept, accepted, and acceptable. So everybody say, I accept it. I'm accepted. And it's acceptable for me to use it. See, I've heard many a Christian, well, I don't feel as I can go out. Why do you lie against the Holy Spirit? He put this power and this grace in you sovereignly. He's not going to take it away from you, but he wants you to get out there and magnify it. Let people know how much God loves them. But if we go into the kitty corner with all the babies and go, oh, they stink over there, and oh, they're bad over there, and oh, look at that bunch over there, and we will nullify the grace of God. Grace says there's a portal that I wanted you to be, and now I can't use thee because you have put a door you have put a screen on it. You're saying, I'm going to screen the people that come through the door. That's not our place. There's a place where we have to say, God, I thank you right now that your word is true. Ephesians 1.6. It said, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable in the blood. Now, what is the praise of the glory of his grace? He hath made us accepted in the blood. Say, I'm accepted. See, everything that I earn or deserve is nothing. But everything that's freely given is everything. The minute the devil can get you in your mind thinking about what you deserved or what you did right or wrong to condition you for the blessings of God, you just judge Jesus that his faithfulness to his Father's will was to die for you and me. Can I get an amen? Then he did it. It's not going to happen again. And so therefore, he wants you to negate the devil's lies of saying you need to work and perform to have it. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, one thing that you've got to understand, what gave you grace and favor was belief in his name. I mean only. Listen, salvation is not uh, faith, Word works equals salvation. No. It's word, faith, salvation. That's where grace is. Grace is God's nullifying our sinful activities based on the atomic nature, and now he is presenting us before him spotless and without blame because of his son. That name that's above every name, the name Jesus. And boy, whenever you hear that name... The demons in hell, they just scramble. Because why? Jesus is Lord. And they know it. They don't get another shot. We did. We're the ones that got born again. We're the ones that accepted that grace gift. Jesus will never reject those who believe in him. Say, he can't reject me. 
Well, I know, Brother Benson, well, they stopped believing in him. I think the Holy Spirit is a little bit stronger. I, I, I got saved when I was 12 years old. And I went to hell for 18 solid years after that. Drug addiction, alcoholism, prison, wrecks, tragedies, horrors, you name it, I went through it. But guess who went through it with me? Jesus. I would not be in front of you today sitting here preaching the gospel if Jesus hadn't been with me. He saved me from more things than I didn't want to talk about. But you know what? He's got to see your faith that believes in him. And that's what he knows. Most people condemn themselves because they don't live good enough. That's why religious preaching that condemns people for not being in church or condemns people for not praying enough or condemns people for not doing something that they deem more special. That is corruption. Jesus said, you had nothing to do with your election. It was me. Jesus is God. He sat there and said, these are mine. I chose them. John 15, 16, he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And you know who he told that to? He told that to John. Now, wasn't John, John the beloved? Huh? Wasn't he the one who put his head on Jesus' bosom? Huh? I mean, of all the rest of them, they all envy John. So, so guess what? Jesus went to John. And he said, John, remember something, John 15, 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Remember, son, don't ever get braggadocious and prideful because the others envy you because you were closer to me. I chose you. That's what's important. Not what you show and influence others by. It's what I and you have a relationship. I chose you. And he said, because you responded properly, I give you the responsibility of taking care of my mother from the cross. You see my mother? You see your mother. Take care of her. Love will always get you more responsibility from the kingdom. The more you learn how to respond in love, the more responsibility you will get because that's what God's looking for. Those who are building their life off the grace gifts of God, which is a love gift from our Father. Can I get an amen? amen? See, we are made acceptable through the blood. When you see Ephesians, you see it. He said, you have been made acceptable. And the hardest thing to do is look at somebody in the eyeballs, and I see them drifting when I try to talk to them. And I say, stop drifting. Did you see what he said? He made you acceptable. You don't make yourself acceptable. That's why there's so many people falling away and backsides. They don't feel that they can do it. Nobody can do it. It was God who made the plan to come redeem mankind. And you and I have got to accept that as a gift of the grace of our living God and never put God as the bad guy. Bad things happen, all kinds of horrors happen in your life, but thank God grace has sealed you into a place when one day you see God, he won't see you in the sinful condition that your flesh is in, but he will see you in the righteous condition that his son was in. John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. See, what is the work of God? Believing. Your and our work is to believe that God can't lie and what God said he will do. God will do it. He said, I will hasten to perform my word. Just put me in remembrance of it. Remind me of what I said. Remind me. Quit looking at your favorite teachers and your favorite people and these things that look certain ways in the natural. You do not know another man's heart. I don't care how great the preaching, how wonderful it is. I mean, people fall out in the power. Remember, the Bible said, though these men do all these things and they don't have love, they're just a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Don't be impressed by somebody else's jurisprudence. Be impressed with the God who saved you. And put him first and prioritize his will for your life. Then you're going to start seeing that there are things that God required. 
See, grace is that which bestows or occasions pleasure, delight. How can anyone enjoy God or Christianity without receiving grace? I was in that measure of good, bad, high, low, up, down, right or wrong, trying to always position yourself into perfection. Anybody ever try to do that? And all of a sudden you found out you got sicker and sicker and sicker because you were trying to intellectually understand God. He showed me one time, he said, James, it's like taking a 110-volt air conditioner window unit and going over to a 480 socket and plugging it in and turning it on. It would burn up instantly. Just He said, if you try to take your finite brain and stick it into my infinite brain, your brain was not made to hold the capacity to understand God. But he gave you a spirit. That's eternal, and it's deep, and it's wide. And you don't even have to remember because he will bring it out of your remembrance. He will bring it back when you need it. See, we don't have to think, oh, God, i got to hurry up and get all this in me because he might not be there. He says, quit sweating it. I ain't going nowhere. I'm with you until you go home. Even when I make mistakes? Even when you make mistakes. Don't sell me out like I'm a a cheap trickster sitting up here trying to hurt you. I'm not. I'm trying to get you to walk in the fullness of what I have for you. See, God is pleased to bless. He's not angry about it. I've seen people that literally get angry because God would bless me. And they go, well, I just don't understand, man. Why, why would he bless you? I had a friend of mine one time he said their child was uh, had some mental conditions that were off. And he was a friend of mine as a childhood, and he, and he asked me, he said, James said, nothing personal. I know you've got three beautiful children, and how come God lets you have three pretty kids, and you were such a dog, and used all the drugs and all the stuff you did, and I didn't. I had a child that was Down syndrome. I said, brother, I don't know. I can't give you that answer. But I wouldn't fault God for it. I wouldn't resent the fact that God chose you for someone special. And that child was a special child. And it really is. It was a gorgeous situation. How it worked out. And he loved that child. But it's just that, again, those thoughts in our mind. How come God would let something like that happen to me? Well, God said, how come Adam brought sin into the world when he could have just stayed righteous and holy and had a blessed life, we'd had a blessed kingdom? So that why has just got to be left to God. We've got to say thank you, God, that every day is a gift, and we've got to learn how to participate in it and walk in it. Can I get an amen? James 1, 5. He says, any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. In the Amplified, it says, If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching or fault-finding, and it will be given to him. I've almost had people qualify me. When, when, when God gave me my home, a guy walked up and gave me a house, and here God told me to give you a house. Oh, wow. Try to give it back to him. He said, No. God, I, have, I said, you need to pray. I said, I have, I have prayed. I prayed and fasted for a week, and God still told me through three different uh, voices, through different ministers without saying a word. Well, I guess i got to take it. I mean, I can't, you know. It's your blessing. And so, but I had people come up to me and say, what would you do to con that dude out of that house? What? Well, you know, you're a good talker, man. Would you jack him up and... See, there are people that don't understand. There is a living God, and he does speak, and he will talk to you if you listen and shut up and let him talk. He will take Scripture, and he will make it real to you. He will make it real to you. I didn't say it's going to make it real to your brother or someone down the street, but I don't care. I need to know what's real. I need to embark on the journey that God has for me and be trusting in him only and do what he said whether I qualify for it or not. 
Too many times we will shut down God because we don't qualify in our own mind. And God says, how dare you insult me? I saved you. I healed you. I deliver you. I make you strong. It's not you. I take you when you're weak, and I will use you. Can I get an amen? See, Grace is, is like there's a stress on its freeness and universality, its spontaneous character. On the part of the receiver, it leaves a sense of favor bestowed and a feeling of gratitude. One that, that's that, that, to me, that wonderful feeling when you finally got it in your heart that God loved you. That, I mean, it doesn't matter. You don't even know where you're going to go, what you're going to do, what you're going to be, but you know one thing, you're free. You know that he loves you. He plants that inside you. See, God's perfection and our ability to perform are something that we got to look into question about. Romans 3.20. He said, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Grace has said you have provision. Grace says he will supply. Grace says fear not. Grace says, rise up. Grace says, be blessed. Can I get an amen? Grace has an enemy that tries to attack it. It's called the oughts. Everybody say the oughts. See, that's obligations. That's the shoulds. I should pray. I ought to have behave better. I ought to read the Bible more. I ought to memorize more scripture. See, there are people that see what people got and what they've gone to Bible school and they've gone through everything else and all of a sudden they almost universally pick it out and say, well, they deserve more than I do because they've done more than I've done. God don't look in his nursery and say, well, there's some really promptious ones I like. Oh, you know, them kind of shove them aside. They might not make it anyway. God is not that kind of father. He's an equal opportunity, grace-giving God who will take the least person and raise them up to the greatest if they'll just believe. If they'll just believe what he said. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, or Daddy God. Now, listen, in the Jewish generation that these guys were teaching in, that was alien. You never call God your father. I mean, when Jesus said, teach us how to pray, Jesus. Okay, you ready? Our father, which art in heaven. Those guys were lost on the first two words. Our father. All they knew was Abraham was their father. They were sons of Abraham. Now you're saying, we're sons of God? Yeah. What Jesus was saying, I'm coming to do. I'm to make you sons and daughters. Can I get an amen? See, the Spirit brings freedom, not the bondage of fear. Anything that tries to lead you by fear is not the Holy Spirit. It's not God. Fear takes an occasion of flesh, and it slays you. He said, perfect love casts out all fear. Where fear is, there's torment. If you're vexed and you're tormented with something, it's fear. It's a spirit. And everything that comes with that spirit, you must renounce it. You've got to reject the spirit of fear. You've got to reject when it brings you into hostile captivity. Anytime you've been abased by that spirit, it's jumped on you. You've got to fight your way through it and say, have faith in God. I am not going to let this thing win. The, the, the things that you're going to see that, that are a part of that oughts, what it produces is guilt and condemnation. Any time you feel yourself under guilt and con this condemnation, listen to me, earned and created or not, when you feel condemned, if nothing else, repent. Say, 
God, I did, I, I, that's wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, my God, God. But just because you don't feel beat up and tortured because you just say, I'm sorry, and you didn't get whipped and smacked and beat down, you've known the other guy too long. That's what he does. God, every time I've seen like I've repented and asked God to forgive me for something, he blesses my socks off. I go, what? wait a minute. You think you ought to get a little downtime being beat up because you did bad? He goes, no, that's not me. I set you free. You, you fell away. You did something, oh, oh, I fixed it. So just accept it. Come forward. Failure. How many times have you failed at something that you wouldn't even want to try anymore because you failed? Failure stands at your door and says, I don't care what Grace said. I know you're a failure. Look how many times you tried this and you didn't make it. You need to say, go to hell, failure. I'm going to try. I'm a righteous man falls down seven times. That must mean you must fail. And get back up. You keep getting up. Why? Because the one who told you to get up is going to back you up. Low self-esteem. Well, brother, I just was born on the wrong side of the tracks. I'm the wrong color. I don't know what I'm doing in my life. Repent. Jesus was olive colored. He wasn't white. He wasn't black. He was green. I mean, he was olive colored. That's what the Bible says about it. He was olive colored. Low self-esteem. It'll grip you in the heart and say, you know better. You will never be nothing. You don't have any education. Every preacher looks at you as a nobody. You're not, what have you got? They don't seek after you for any committees or any kind of programs. You know, and you will go to seed on that low self-esteem, and you will hate yourself because you don't think that God's deal fair with you. So that's why he said that he's no respecter of persons. He's not wanting you to ever see yourself in that light of somebody else's success. He wants you to see the light of his love and his success in you in spite of you. A high level of stress and anxiety from works and frustrations. I told a guy the other night, he came to me, he said, oh, I went to this big old, we went to this conference, and man, it was awesome, man, this guy was, man, he was cranking, he was so awesome. And I said, really? He said, yeah, man, we, we didn't get out of there, we didn't get home till midnight. I said, really? What a shame. So what about the children? Was there a lot of kids sleeping on the, on the pews? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a lot of that. Sin, sin, brother. Parents that left their kids that should have been home getting their sleeping and getting done and going to school the next morning, getting up early, getting fed, getting... You are not telling me that God honors that abuse. Those kids will have bad stories when they get older. My parents made me stay up all night out there at them hallelujah meetings, and, and then they run me out. Look to me. God don't have to use poison to get rid of ants. You got antsy? Then go home. Take your kids. Your wife's not wrong. She says, honey, we got to go. I got to get up in the morning. I got to go to work too. I got to get the kids in bed. That's the Holy Ghost. You just overrode it for the activity that you go, woo, woo, man, that's awesome. Woo. I said, what do you remember from the meeting that night? Tell me. Well, not very much. So you're telling me you invested all that time and really into just to feel good. I ain't going to do nothing when the devil comes against you. Listen, there's a wisdom that says, put your life in order, do what's right, and God will vindicate you and the rest of it. Amen? Anger and depression due to negative emotions about the whole system. You can get so sick and tired of being sick and tired that I can almost can't stick to watch the news anymore. Because none of them want to tell you the truth. They just want to tell you what's bad or what's good, depending on what side of the team they're on. You can go to one side that's negative about it, and the other side that's positive about it. And they're both fighting something that they say, please, we don't ever want this fixed. Because that's why we make our millions. If it was fixed, we wouldn't have a job. So what do we listen to that junk for? It's only to depress you. A hard-hearted attitude due to legalism. Legalism will kill you. Legalism will give you ten reasons why seven reasons don't work when five reasons will. And pretty soon you're so wrapped around all this ideolic stuff in your brain that you're not cool, you're not nice, you're not friendly, you're not devoted, you're just miserable. And then you're saying, well, y'all come join our misery ship. Be like the rest of us. No, I like to, I'd rather go to the beach, sit around and talk to God in the waves and sit there and be beaten and battered down and abused. See, it's learning that God is not that guy. God is the good guy. 
being overly scrupulous due to be damaged, overly sensitive conscious. Too many times, how many times have you been overly sensitive? You would want to do something, but you felt, no, I wouldn't be good enough. I'd, I'd mess up. I'd fail. That is not from God. You will never know unless you try. You will never unless you stick a foot out. God won't put the first foot out. He wants you to do it. And then when you do it, grace will continually supply everything you need to do it. See, self-rejection is self-hatred. Many people that have been abused and battered in their life, they hate themselves. I know people that literally will destroy themselves and want to fail because they wrote in their mind, I should never be a success. I don't deserve it. I was too bad. I did all this junk. Somebody precious I love died because of me. All these other things that people hang on to and they forget you're judging yourself falsely. And God does not want you to do that. Romans 8, 2, he says, for the law for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So what is the law of the spirit? It's a life in Christ. Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So really you have two spirits working inside you. You've got the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And you have the law of sin and death in your members. So inside you, even though you're born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking tongues, prophesying, everything else, you have an atomic nature that lives inside you. And the law that was produced against that nature, the Ten Commandments and all the legal aspirations of truth, it says you can never be made right apart from the faith of the Son of God. You can try all you want to be good and you're going to only find that it's bad still in you. But when you get to the grace of God and you say, I resolve today to die, I'm going to become alive to the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Then live in Christ. Live and let the spirit of God mortify your deeds of your flesh and let you start transforming into the person God wants you to be. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherein Christ has made you what? And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul said, look, church, I'm trying to tell you, Galatians, you guys have been bewitched. You went following Judaizers to try to bring you back into Judaism. What are you doing? Have you lost your mind? Look at me. You're free. Whom the Son sets free is free in. You have to say what God says, or you will be captured and arrested by legalistic people who will drag grace and mercy down into the ditch and lift up law again. I hate, I tell you, more than facing a prostitute, I would hate to face a preacher that's trying to tell me that grace ain't enough. I've had him tell me, you're a foolish man. You don't know. You'll fail. Well, I'm going to fail in grace. I'm going to stand trust. I give my life to him. I can't fix me. I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. And I'm going to tell it to the world. Praise God, you're looking at the worst man on the earth. Paul said, I was the chief of sinners. Paul said, you look at me, you see sin. But if you listen to me, you'll hear grace. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. It's that liberty and freedom that I didn't deserve. And my enemy says, that ain't fair. Why do you get there? I said, look, I hate the sin. You think I, I compliment, I like. I don't like sin. Anybody here like sin? No, but it's there. It stands at the door of our heart to try to slay us. Jesus told Peter, he said, look, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. But I have interceded for you that you will not fail. That's why he could deny Jesus and reject him and do all the things he did. But he didn't fail. He didn't die. The other guy hung himself. But not Peter. Peter went out there and, and he stayed out. And he said, you know, God, kill me. I'm worthless. I don't deserve nothing. I'm horrible. And Jesus came back to dead and said, go get the disciples and Peter. Thank God he separated that. He said, and Peter. And guess what, Pete? I didn't make no mistake. You're going to be the head of the church. Ooh, that's good. That's good. Everybody said, that's good. See, 
the fear of rejection, the fear of man and man pleasing must be resisted. You cannot afford to let your plans be distorted or distracted by critics. Every man of God who's ever done anything stepped out in faith. Lester Sumrall, who traveled all over the world, established 35, 40 churches all over the world, a big old Bible college, did everything, little old farmer guy. And that guy, he would sit there and say that he couldn't preach himself out of a wet paper bag. He said everywhere he went, he was never asked back. He traveled and he went and he preached and he healed and he delivered and he did everything God told him to do. He said he, in cow patties, we had to step over the patties. He preached out them on a, on a stump. But he refused to say, I made a mistake. This is what God told me to do. If your steps of the righteous are ordered to the Lord, then the grace gift of God will make room for you. This world is not going to be reached by going to somewhere where it's guffy and fluffy. They're going to go where it's committed and dedicated and they're devoted to learning about Jesus and who he is and what they represent. That's why people don't come to church and sit down like this and learn. They don't want this. Oh, give me something that's more cool, man. Let's get it on. And then they're out there falling away in the gourds, being trampled and hurt. Because why? They run into some of the difficult challenges that Satan puts on people, and they don't have any depth in themselves, and they fall away. See, we got to get depth inside each other. we got to understand that God's grace is sufficient. Galatians 2.11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Paul opposed Peter, a man pleaser. He looked at Peter, and Peter left the Jew boys, out, I mean the Gentile boys outside, John, Mark, and all them. He wouldn't go. He went in there with the Jewish guys, uh, brethren. He went back there and started eating with them and talking the law and all this good stuff, reminiscing old days. Paul walked in there and said, what are you doing back here? Do you think these guys are better than your brothers out there? I got off with you, Peter. See, wrong is wrong. And if anything tries to make some group better than the other group, and that's what religion has spun off ever since, if somebody says, I'm tired of that way, let's do it our way. And they break off and they do it our way. And they keep breaking off and doing it our way. That ain't the way it's supposed to be. It's to break off from all of it and do it the right way. To bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Galatians 1.10. For, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You realize that when you're talking to someone about Jesus, you're not trying to do it for what benefit they're going to get. You're doing it because it needs to be done. Whether they receive it or reject it is none of your business. The point is you, you bring it to them. You present them something that only the Holy Spirit can make active in their life. Not you, not me. That's what we have to see, that grace wants us to be an accompaniment. We are a provider of the grace gift that he put in us to give away to other people. And so therefore, we can't be the judge and the fruit inspectors with it. See, someone will always find a work for you to do to be right with God. Well, you know, all you guys are really wonderful. I'm so glad you came to church. And, <clears throat> but you know, God's really not pleased with you. <clears throat> he needs more of you doing this and doing that and get this and get that because the vision is requiring it to get there. <clears throat> oh, are we watching The Wizard of Oz? I'm the great Oz! And that little dog opens up the curtain, and there's this old crippled old man back there pulling swings. Oh, my God! Look, God doesn't need any kind of that manipulation. He doesn't need someone saying, you're going to get it because you follow me. No, he needs someone to say, you're going to get it because you follow Christ. You learn where he's at. He's inside you. You've got to learn he's inside you. You've got to accept that. You've got to believe that. You've got to walk it out with him, and he will make you a way that you will be totally happy with. Can I get an amen? See, we can't be free if we're a man pleaser. You start serving men, and all of a sudden, they got more to do and more to do and more to do and more to do, and then you're a sick person. You wind up abused. I always heard overuse will always lead to abuse. You must understand there's no cause greater than you. You being at peace with God 
and glorifying God with your existence, just being you for God, is what he wants. Hebrews 4, 9. He said, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Everybody say rest. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us therefore labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Actually, <clears throat> when you've already got it, you got it. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to show it off. You don't have to protect it. And there's people that say, well, there's more to just being saved. So you, and they start you on a treadmill that tries to get you to fulfill what they're trying to accomplish. Not necessarily what God wants accomplished. I think Paul was saying, look, there remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that entereth into his rest, he also ceases from his own works, as God did from his. That means I don't work to get recognition. I don't work because I get something out of it. I work because it pleases him. I do what he's assigned me to do. Therefore, as each one of us make that heart's decision that grace has got me, I'm already caught. Now I need to be free so I can go out there and set others free. That is what's important. That's what God wants to do. See, the word rest, this word refers to a Sabbath rest. There's a Sabbath rest available for your soul. This is a spiritual rest, not a physical rest. Do you hear what I said? It's a spiritual rest. When you realize that God loved you, you received that love, and he took that spirit man and placed it back inside you that Adam forfeited from us. Now you got that spirit man back in there, and he is eternal. Everybody say eternal. He's not temporary. He's not subject to being changed or aloof or pulled away. He can be embarrassed because he was too weak and inept and didn't know his position and fall short in an area, but the spirit is not ever going to be pulled out of God. He said, I will abide with you forever. See, we have to strive to enter into that rest. Rest concerns your past and your future. Can I get amen? Rest concerns your faults. Look, peace be still and know that I am God, Vicki. Peace be still and know that I am God, Steve. That is the work of the kingdom, to be at peace that you don't have to work. You don't have to earn. You don't have to deserve. Grace is disannulled by effort. It takes patience to sit and say, I don't understand everything, but I know this. He loves me, and he'll abide with me forever. Psalms 103, 14. For he knoweth our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Do you realize sometimes we try to give ourselves all kinds of added strength and armor and think we're something better and all that stuff? When God says, you all came from dirt. Why are you trying to look at yourself as one's high and one's low? Why don't you just love each other and enjoy each other by the giftings that I placed in each one of you? 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of God. Us. I put my name there and say, but James Benson has this treasure in his earthen vessel that the excellency and the power may be of God and not of me. See, make the Bible you. Make it God, your father, talking to his son. 1 Peter 1.24 24. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away. Man. Man described as withering grass. Was he trying to make a significant point there saying, why are you so concerned about you in this natural state? Why aren't you just concerned about me and my will, what I want done? I, I, uh, watch my niece said it in a book I already said, to me, the reason Christians are sick and die early is because they're, they're too self-centered. They're too self-concerned about self. He said, dead people that live for Christ live long lives. Because it ain't worried about God's got my life. I'm, I'm just going to live out my days that he's got numbered for me. And I'm going to do his will. 
It's more important about you than it is me. It's more important about meeting people in Walmart like I did today or Sam's and praying with someone and sitting down and ministering to somebody. Why? Because that is God's will, that his word is going forth in the earth. Can I get an amen? See, James 4.14 Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. Do you ever consider that earth has been here, oh, they must have 240 million years, or all this stuff, and all these figures, and the universe is billions of years old. And you and I, I'm 64. It's beyond fathoming in your brain. It's a peanut in the middle of an ocean. It, you just, sometimes when you think about God made himself real to a little peanut and a great genius in technology and science has no clue who he is. But that's a God who loves his creation. That he would get down in this room and say, I love each one of you and all you on TV. He said, I love you. You are what's important. The world's not going to change by this big global picture. It's going to change by you and your love for others. When you see Jesus Christ meant to be the way, the truth, and the life, then we'll walk upright, grab that grace, grip a hold to it, and walk forward. Philippians 3.9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Faith is in the unseen, unfelt area of your life. You're not going to feel it. Because if you start going by feeling saved, you're going to get on that windshield wiper. Save, lost, save, lost, save, lost, save, lost. Why? Because you have not settled the issue in your heart that God's grace and love and mercy and kindness is forever for you. And he called you right when you call you wrong. That's where you get the truth. The light comes on. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. But you got it. So live it. Give it away. Be happy about it. Don't try to be religious and dogmatic and put it all formulized and all that stuff. Just get up and say, hey, man, God is good. All the time. See, he's the God kind of righteousness. That's what gives us a freedom because it's not ours. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. He gave it to me. Hebrews 6.1 Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptism, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. Repentance and abandonment of dead works are elementary teachings. Do you realize that every child of God starts off and wants to do something? They don't usually get the green light and check God for it. They just go do it. And then they get some little recognition for it, and they get happy about it. They go, woo-hoo, I'm on a trail now. I got it blazing. He just made a big turn the wrong way. First said, that's okay, God. Just bless me what I do. I'll, I'll do it. That's your strength. You're right back. You're still back there at the gate. Till you understand it's not by your might, nor by your power, nor by your ability or anything you have or possess. It's by his grace alone that you will do anything for him. Hebrews 5.13 For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. See, intellectual is not responsible. Intellectual is that you hold it till it gets into your spirit. Then you know it's in your spirit because you activate it and use it. Grace gives you the strength to go forward and do what your brain tells you you can't do. You just step out and you do it. And God then grows you and makes you what's called mature. There's imperfections and weaknesses in believers. Don't cover it. Don't hide it. God used us as a peculiar people. Can I get an amen? 
in Numbers eleven fourteen. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. Wah, wah, wah. And if thou dealst thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of thy hand if I found a favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me the seventy men and the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bearest it not thyself alone. You don't have to bear nothing alone. God will make a way of escape. God will make somebody always bring a provision for you. Moses said he couldn't do it anymore, and God gave him the help. See, God don't want us whining and complaining. He wants us asking. Hello? This is hurting, God. This is hard. It's so hard to live as a Christian. No, it's not. It's only hard if you won't believe him. He will always make a way. Don't feel like you need to hide your weakness from God. Remember, he already knows them. <laughs> Jeremiah 1, 5, he said, Before I formed you, I called you, appointed you, and I knew you. You realize that before you and I knew our mother and father, God knew us. He knew us. Look at the choices of the disciples of Jesus. Matthew 26, 40. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Peter, you are unable to pray with me. You, I gave you an order and you didn't do it. I told you, Satan come come and assist you. I told you. And stay away. <laughs> Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Custody of Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I and the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say this and some say that and all this good stuff. But whom do you say I am? He said, Simon Peter answered, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, when you see him talking here, he's telling him his position. He's saying, Simon, or Jonah, flesh and blood is not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, I, Jesus, that thou art Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever thou shalt bind on earth, then it will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Wow, that's pretty powerful, huh? But then he turned right around and said, now let me tell you all the things that I'm going to do. I'm going to go in every beaten and tormented and crucified and raised on the third day. Nah, you ain't going to do that. See, Peter shows carnality, but declares his faith in Jesus. Understand, we have all got carnality, but we declare our victory in Jesus. We declare our victory in Jesus. It's not looking at yourself as one day being perfect. You're not in this life. As long as you've got an earth suit, you're not going to be perfect. But when we get the new glorified body, that's a different subject. But not now. We've got to deal with the nasty now now. And this is how we do it. Mark 9, 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise on the third day. But they understood not the saying and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be greatest. See, this shows a lack of comprehension, fear, and pride. Listen, guys, those guys walked with him three and a half years, and they still didn't know who they were with. I mean, they saw him doing all kinds of things nobody ever done before, and they check it out. What is this? But they still sat there and didn't know who they were with. They didn't know him in the way he was going to show them. In Genesis 32, for sake of time, we see that Jacob was a trickster, a schemer, a swindler, but he wrestled with God and would not let him go. God changed him, renamed him to Israel, which means contender with God. He went away limping. 
but he went away anointed. His weakness had been pointed out and faced, but he pressed in for God to bless him. One thing about, understand, God knows our, our weaknesses. He knows our strengths. But that's not what he wants us to measure ourselves by. He wants us to measure ourselves by the grace that he's provided. Healing belongs to us. Deliverance belongs to us. Faith belongs to us. Hope belongs to us. Love belongs to us. It's not something we're going to obtain. It's something we already obtain. But you've got to see it through grace. You've got to understand God's love and mercy. Or you'll never show love and mercy to anybody else. Amen. You want to see something tonight? Praise God. Let's stand. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I just come to you tonight in Jesus' name. I thank you for your word, God. I thank you that it's going to enrich our lives. And God, we've got a lot to do. Age has no bearings. I thank you, Lord God, we are not those who look at our outward man. We look at our inner man and that we're growing in the grace and revelation of your will and purpose for our life. And as long as we got breath, God, we're going to speak into somebody's life. Now, Father, we say, anoint us. Let actually your anointing that's already in us rise up to the place that we can see it, that it's tangible. And, God, we will never back down, but we will press to bless somebody else. In Jesus' name, and we all say it. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.